Right now, it's time to bring in Arthur Schwartz, uh, the food maven. Arthur joins us on a Monday morning. We talk about food, 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 you know, all sorts of various forms. Good morning, Arthur. It's the, it's the cool before the heat wave, <laughs> and you won't be happy when it's the heat wave either. So uh, you remind me of my neighbors when I lived in Midtown Manhattan. I lived in a 20, 30-story well, building. I was on the 22nd floor, so I got to hear a lot of conversations on the way up and down. And, you know, mainly it was it was too hot, too cold, too windy, too sunny, whatever. I love hot weather. Hot and humid. I, I love see, it. I don't. I don't. I anyway, what I don't love, I am getting to be my mother and father both in my old age, is uh, restaurants anymore. I mean, I, I, I know it's partly because I know too much and I've eaten too much. And I used to be a restaurant critic, and so I can't walk into a place without being somewhat critical. Uh, I, I try to go, go to places where I don't think I'll have to be critical. Um, and one of those happened this last week. A friend of mine uh, uh, and I both couldn't wait to go to this place. It's a new Palestinian restaurant on Atlantic Avenue where used to be all... Middle Eastern, but isn't so much anymore because that part of Brooklyn is very gentrified. Uh, but this, the Great Sahadi Market is still there. Uh, the, the Damascus Bakery is still there. This is all on Atlantic Avenue in, in I, the Brooklyn Heights side of Atlantic Avenue. And then there are other um, Middle Eastern stores. Anyway, this one isn't part of that old group. Most of those people, by the way, were Syrian. Um, and there's a Yemeni restaurant also on Atlantic Avenue. That's been there for many years. This place is billed as a Palestinian family restaurant. And if you look at the menu online, so I was prepared for this, you can see that all the food comes in enormous portions. Uh, uh, and they charge thusly for, you know, that everything feeds at least two. And you could order it for six. So, uh, and believe me, if you ordered it for six, you'd probably be able to feed eight. So it, it has attracted the young people who have gentrified the neighborhood, not your old time Middle Eastern people. Um, and it is the noisiest place I've been to in years. You could not enjoy dinner uh, in this atmosphere, even though it is an enormous space, high ceilings, uh, uh, you would think in the cavernous space like this, the noise would go somewhere other than in your ear, but it doesn't. So even though we were only four, uh, it was unbearable. We could barely have a conversation. Uh, anyway, moving on to the food. So I, this is food that I'm familiar with. It's not that exotic. It's not exotic at all to me. I mean, there were some dishes on the menu that I was unfamiliar with. In fact, one thing I was really interested in is something called Uzi, which is the the Palestinian slash Jordanian rice dish. So, as I was saying, yes. hello, yes, we're back. Yeah, when did I get cut off? Just as you started uh, about about the amount of food. All oh, right. So the thing is, of uh, the amount of food. So. But, Forget the amount of food. It attracts a lot. Uh, 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 on a Tuesday night, actually, when we got there for very early dinner, the place was, you know, wasn't full. By the time we left at eight eight thirty, um, you know, we're old. We eat early. Uh, eight thirty, it was unbelievable. I mean, you could have been in the in a airplane hangar with the airplane on. So that's aside the food. So one of the things that I had to eat at this place is uh, moussakan, not moussaka, but moussakan, which is chicken uh, on top of, more or less, a bed of sautéed onions that have been sautéed with sumac. Now, sumac is easy for me to buy. It's in my supermarket around the corner. Uh, if you go to Atlantic Avenue, you would go to Sahadi and buy sumac at a really good price. Uh, and uh, fortunately, I have a Middle Eastern-owned supermarket in my neighborhood that has a whole Sahadi corner, so I can walk to a, a 
my essential Sahadi, uh, uh, only a few blocks away. Anyway, the, the onions are sautéed with sumac, and this is all put on top of bread. It should be, in my estimation, extremely thin lavash type bread, which is not so hard to find these days, but if you can't find it, a good substitute bread is a pita bread. I would split them in half, uh, meaning not to make pockets, but to make two uh, r- circles of bread, and then let it dry out for a day. Just put them on the counter, maybe on a rack, and let them get dry. Uh, if you happen to have stale pita that you want to use up, that's even better. So, um, I don't mean stale, but I mean dehydrated pita. And you, you, you put the bread down on a, a sheet or a platter or whatever, and you douse it with some chicken broth, and then you top it with the onions and chicken, and you stick it under the broiler. It's usually served with uh, uh, pine nuts and yogurt. Not a lot of yogurt, but you could drizzle like a yogurt thing over it. But the thing is, this, this I must say, the one thing in this restaurant that I, uh, a hint that I'm going to use is that because pine nuts are so crazy expensive, um, and I, I know you can buy them at a reasonable price too, but those pine nuts that you buy at a reasonable price are a variety that some people have uh, allergic reactions to. And, and I've heard other bad stories about them. But in any case, they used uh, what I would call sl- slivered almonds, Toasted slivered almonds, which is, I think, even better than the pine nuts. Anyway, I make this dish, so I had to have it in, in a Palestinian restaurant, but I have a quirk, Marshall. Everybody, I'm confessing. If I eat something mediocre to not so good in a restaurant, the first thing I have to do when I get home is make it. <laughs> <laughs> Myself. <laughs> Even sometimes dishes that I'm not that familiar with, but this one, get, one reminded me how good mine is. <laughs> <laughs> and what I what I do is I I don't roast the chicken. I I know that a lot of people think it's supposed to have roast chicken on top, but wherever I learned this dish from, I don't remember who I learned it from. I'm sure a home cook. Uh, you poach the chicken, or you know, simmer the chicken. Uh, it, I, I do it in a deep skillet, covered, you know, what's called the, uh, a sauté pan, uh, a straight-sided deep skillet, uh, and I, I, I just put them in, in a pan. I use just chicken thighs, and if you like white meat, you can do this with white meat. Whatever if you want to make a whole chicken, you can do a whole chicken. Anyway, you put it in the in, in the simmering water. I do one crushed clove of garlic. That's all, and some salt in the water, and that's about it. And you simmer it. Usually it only takes about a half an hour for chicken thighs. And uh, then let it cool. And you have a nice, simple broth to moisten your dry bread. You put your sautéed, I use olive oil, very well sautéed, very limp, um, uh, with, with for about, let's say, for two pounds of onions. You need a lot of onions for this. I would use a couple tablespoons of sumac and uh, salt, pepper, and then you put, spread that on the uh, on the moistened bread, and then you put your uh, chicken pieces. I, what I would do is I would put half the onions on the bread and the other half toss with the the chicken, which you've taken off the bone, in big pieces. And that's it. Uh, when you're ready to, and you can do that ahead. So my friend Roseanne, with I was in the restaurant with her and her husband, Michael. And uh, my friend Roseanne reminded me, and I'd totally forgotten this, that we once did a charity event together, and I cooked moussakan for 50 people, or maybe it was even more. And the reason I chose this dish to serve at this particular meal was because it could be made so far ahead. I mean, you could do it all in the morning, and then at the last minute, you stick it under the broiler and 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 get it glazed and heated. And and the the end, the, the the bread, I like it when it gets very crispy at the edges, but the bottom part of the bread is going to be nice and soft. By the way, in the restaurant, the bread was so tough we could even cut it with a knife. 
I don't know what they were using. Um, and then I would put a drizzle on top. This makes it look good, too. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, in the old days, I used to have to drain my own yogurt and thin it out with a little water to make a drizzle of yogurt sauce on top. These days, you already have the drained yogurt. It's called Greek yogurt. So take your strained yogurt and add some cold water just by the tablespoon until it gets to the consistency of a drizzle. And drizzle that over your, uh, if you can buy a, um, a labneh. Uh, the, the over you know the Middle Eastern strain yogurt you can get use that even better um, and drizzle that over the top and then it makes a great presentation and as I said the one thing I got out of this restaurant meal was to use slivered almonds um, I don't know if they toast them in a pan or in the broiler or in the oven whatever you might actually I'm thinking put them put the almonds on top of the uh, musakan as it's assembled and stick that under the broiler and the, the almonds will get uh, toasty enough. Anyway, the other thing that we ordered that was not up to mine, if I may say, and everybody at the table who had eaten mine and everybody at the table had eaten mine, they said, yours is better. So I'm going to make that. I was actually going to make this the other day because I happened to have two nice, really nice uh, red peppers. Uh, but I use the red peppers for something else, and I'm going to go out and buy some peppers today. The other day when I had the peppers, I had to go out to buy fresh walnuts, which I did. Now that I don't have the peppers, i got to go out for the peppers. But mohamara is a roasted red pepper and walnut dip, spread, condiment. You, you decide what it is. And you have to start out with roasted peppers. I do not ever use jarred roasted peppers. Even mediocre uh, red peppers in the middle of the winter are better than, and I buy good red peppers actually in the middle of the winter these days. They come from Mexico usually. Um, and, but, uh, and they can be very good. Uh, but, you know, these days you can buy red peppers from somewhere almost all year. So uh, right now they're okay. They're not great, but they're okay enough. And I put them in a 450-degree uh, oven, right directly on the rack of the oven. doesn't matter which rack. And uh, roast them for about 20 minutes. Uh, I would turn them once, uh, because usually one side or the other is getting toastier than the other. You want to roast them in any case until the skin starts turning color. And then put them in a pot. I, I use a pot. A lot of people say a bag, a plastic bag. I like to use a pot. Um, and, I, and just put them in a pot, uh, you know, just as a, an enclosure and cover the pot and let them stand until they get to room temperature. Then very easily the, the skins will come off, the seeds will come out, and you've got gorgeous roasted peppers. Now, I can do a lot of different things with them, but make... One of it, their highest destinations is Muhammad. Uh, I use my little mini processor to make this. If you're doing four peppers, which is what my, I'm looking, I looked in my archive here, that's what my recipe calls for. If you're using four peppers, you can use a, whole, a, a normal food processor. Uh, I, I'm normally making this with two because, we, we, you know, it does last several nice days in the refrigerator, maybe even more than a several. Uh, but, you know, I like it when it's not more than a day or two old, and so I don't make a huge amount if it's just the two of us. So I would use half this recipe, uh, meaning two red peppers, two big red, you know, two big red peppers. comes to almost a pound as it is. Anyway, for that amount of pepper, roasted now and seeded, of course, and peeled, um, I would for four peppers. I would use one cup of walnut halves, shelled walnuts, whatever you want to call them. Two very large cloves of garlic. Uh, that's my. Go I'm telling you this because my table said mine was better, so I'm going to give you exactly what I do. And I use very two very large cloves of garlic. If you don't like garlic so much, I guess you could reduce that. And 
the first thing to do after roasting the peppers is to chop the walnuts and garlic in the food processor. I like to do this before I add anything else, and you know, make sure it's nice and fine. And then you uh, uh, pulsing at the beginning of everything is a good idea. And then you can let it run a couple secs, and then add the peppers uh, and pulse until they're very finely chopped, a coarse puree. Um, and and then add the olive oil, which is mm, about three table for four peppers, three tablespoons of olive oil. And also another product that I keep in the house. You probably don't. By the way, I was because I was going to say everything in this recipe to me is a pantry item except for the uh, peppers. Uh, three tablespoons of pomegranate molasses. This is sort of essential because it gives it that certain flavor that isn't just some kind of pepper puree. So if you can't buy that locally, which is possible, you can definitely get it online. Um, And I think you can actually get it locally because it's not that uncommon an ingredient these days. And I put cumin in mine. Uh, about a half a teaspoon for that amount, not a lot, a half a teaspoon of cumin, a half a teaspoon of salt, could add a little bit more, maybe three-quarters teaspoon of salt. And I like mine a little spicy. So um, I use Aleppo pepper, which is both spicy and sort of sweet at the same time, but you could use cayenne pepper, a quarter teaspoon of cayenne, maybe a little bit more if you like a little spikier spread. Add all that, and then keep whirling your processor until you get a nice fine puree and that's it i chill it for at least oh i'm sorry it's not it this is also sort of essential a half a cup of breadcrumbs i use very plain breadcrumbs made from bread that is nothing but flour and and water and yeast (coughs) and salt no no sugar um, I don't use panko breadcrumbs. I, I've noticed lately that panko has actually become a synonym for breadcrumbs. They're not the same. And if you look at a package of panko, you'll find out that panko crumbs are made from bread that has sugar in it, uh, which is why they brown so much better than normal breadcrumbs. It's the sugar content. Um, anyway, that's it, mohamara. And, uh, you, and, you, and you, it's a nice word to say practice, muhammad. Uh I let it, you know, I, I could make it in the morning for the night, or but I prefer it after it's a day old. And by the way, but at that point, you may want to re-season it a little bit. Um, stir it up. Taste it. Don't, don't eat it all. That's it. So, I don't know. It's a strange week. And carbs are still calming. Except I made something yesterday that was a total disaster in my search for another carb. <laughs> I got a today oh happy Juneteenth. Yes. So, yes. So uh, it's been on my mind and I know this is praising a white guy uh on an African American holiday, but Thomas Jefferson uh is responsible uh, for a lot of Southern cooking, um, being as sophisticated as it is. So, you know, soul food is not just uh, smothered pork chops and macaroni and cheese. It's also things like uh, spoon bread, uh, which I first experienced in Colonial Williamsburg when I was a boy. And ever since, I've been crazy for spoon bread, which is nothing more or less, than a cornbread souffle. So I had it originally at a restaurant called, which is still there, I'm sure, in Colonial Williamsburg, called the King's Arms. And lo and behold, uh, I find, on I don't know what got me getting onto this, but there it is. Um, I, I was online, and I found a recipe for the King's Arms Spoon bread, um, and I made it, of course. 
And by the way, now I know it's all over the this recipe's all over the internet as with different names. I don't know who from where it was originally taken. Uh it's hard to tell these days on the internet where a recipe actually came from. I don't think this is the King's Arms. I made it, it was okay. It was a little heavy. It, I remembered it being more souffléed. And I also remember it, uh, making it years ago and, and, and folding egg whites, in, in, which this one didn't have. This one had a significant amount of um, leavening. I guess it was baking powder. So I made it. It was okay. And um, like in a restaurant, when I eat something that's not so okay, and I've I got to go search for make it myself, Shea Schwartz, um, I, I totally forgot that I actually have a published recipe for spoon bread uh, in my in my first cookbook, Cooking in a Small Kitchen, which was, by the way, reissued it's now a couple of years ago and is available on Amazon as a Macmillan classic cookbook. And I really meant this morning to make the spoon bread recipe in my book but then again, I didn't. But I yesterday made one that I expected to be sensational um, and was a disaster. And that was from what I considered a very reliable source, uh, Natalie Dupree. And Natalie, who I've known forever, um, since she was a cooking teacher at the department store in Atlanta, then she became Miss Food Atlanta, or Miss Atlanta Food, and then she got on TV, and and then she retired to uh, Charleston. And anyway, she she's the doyen, you, we used to say, uh, using a Yiddish word, uh, the, uh, of Southern cooking. And just a few years ago, she's Natalie's in her 80s now, um, and very active, by the way, she wrote a book called uh, mastering the art of Southern cooking, in which she claims that Southern cooking is the mother cuisine of America. Um, maybe she could be right, but that is in large part um, due to Thomas Jefferson, who uh, was in fact our ambassador to France uh, for I forget how many years, and was very curious about cooking. And, and gardening, and brought back uh, plants, and brought back ideas, uh, which, of course, he shared with his African-American cooks. And the African-American cooks, of course, you know, if they came up some, with something really good, they spread it to other African-American cooks. And we are really, that our cuisine is, in fact, largely uh, based on the cooking of these women, Anyway, there weren't too many men doing that. Spoon bread is one of those dishes. It's 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 cornbread. Uh, like let's say it was Jeffersonized. It was Frenchified uh, by folding egg whites into the spoon into the cornmeal base and coming up with a souffle or at least a lightened cornbread. And it's called spoon bread because not a bread you can slice. You have to spoon it out of its baking dish. In my case, the baking dish was, I followed Natalie's recipe to the letter. Gotta say, I didn't do my entire homework here, because Natalie credits the recipe to somebody else, and that somebody else's book is on my shelf here somewhere. Anyway, I made it exactly as written in Natalie's book, and and what was as soon as I read it, I said this can't be right. Remember, I'm an old time recipe editor. Uh, these days, not not even these days. For 25 years, I try to find a cookbook editor who actually knows about cooking. So anyway, uh, they don't. Point is, uh, I, I I realize this had to be wrong, but. I said it's from Natalie's book, and Natalie is so reliable, and she's been doing this for so many years, and this is sort of her, this is an enormous book. This is like, not a table, 
uh, it's not a coffee table book. You could use this as a coffee table. <laughs> it's so big <laughs> and heavy. In fact, I was afraid to uh, getting it down. I was afraid I was going to hurt my back. In any case, uh, uh, it has three cups of liquid for one cup of cornmeal. And I don't rem- recall ever seeing a recipe with that much liquid. But I followed the recipe, as I always do. The first time I make a recipe, I followed it to the T, so especially from a reliable source like Natalie. And, uh, and it was a disaster in that, after a half an hour in the oven, the top was very well browned, which it should not have been. And it felt firm, so I took it out. The recipe does say it could take a little longer than a half an hour, but the top was so dark, or at least it was about to get really dark, uh, that I took it out, and I let it sit for a couple minutes, and uh, because it is a souffle, I wanted to eat it hot. And I dug in, and it was totally liquid on the bottom. So as I suspected, three cups of liquid, in this case, by the way, heavy cream, oh, I'm sorry, not heavy cream, Half and half, uh, that's very rich and also wasn't cheap uh, to make three cups of half and half and one cup of cornmeal. It, it lifted it out of the poor man food category for sure, but having that much. But anyway, so now today, I was going to do this this morning before I got on the air, but then it was just I just didn't get up that easily this morning, even though I've been up a long time. Uh I'm going to make my own recipe for spoon bread, um, which is in my first cookbook, as I said, Cooking in a Small Kitchen. And my recipe calls for, and by the way, uh, more of a poor man recipe, water, and not half and half. And so for one cup of cornmeal, you put in, um, this is an interesting technique I had here, this is my first cookbook, 1978. Um, two tablespoons of butter cut into small pieces. That's so it melts quickly. And one and a half teaspoons of salt. You put that all in a bowl, and you pour over two cups of boiling water and stir it all until the butter is melted, and, of course, the cornmeal is going to get thick, and then let it cool slightly, or let it cool, period, but you know, at least slightly, and then beat in, I would use a wire whisk, four egg yolks, a half a cup of milk, and a half a cup of flour uh, stirred with four teaspoons of baking powder. So this does have real leavening in it. And it also has flour in it, which will help it hold together much better. So I'm going to make this today. Oh, and so you stir all that in together, and then you beat the four egg whites that you have left and fold them in. And this goes into a two-quart casserole, like a, a large souffle dish, and you bake it at, for half an hour at 375, which, by the way, is a little higher temperature than what I did yesterday. And, and don't put it too high in the oven. This is delicious, and it's what do you eat spoon bread with anything, <laughs> truly? Um, but uh, it, it's particularly good with ham. In fact, in, in cooking in a small kitchen, it's part of a menu. And I remember making this menu. I remember the whole day, I have to say. This has got to be pre-1978. I had friends who lived across the street from me who were wine writers. And I was trying to think of some meal that wasn't French because they cooked French um, and that could I could feature some interesting wine and so I made a ham steak baked in milk and I have made this since but what's really hard to find these days is a thick center cut ham steak uh, should be like two pounds of meat two and a half pounds of meat it's, it's, it's to serve a number of people uh, you can. It's very hard. I have to ask my butcher if ever he could get me this. Um, it's about an inch and a quarter thick, an inch and a half thick ham steak, and you rub it with um, ginger, powdered ginger, and brown sugar, and maybe a little dry mustard, and put it in a 
Pyrex dish I always used, and cover it, just, just cover it with milk, which will take almost a quart of milk, and put it in the oven, 350 oven, and it takes about two hours for the milk to totally absorb and evaporate and form this absolutely sensational crust over the ham steak, which has given up a lot of salt and flavor, as you can imagine. And I served that with the spoon bread. And uh, you could, of course, make some cooked greens with that. And uh, the wine was, I don't remember exactly which wine, but I'm pretty sure it was one of the first really good upstate New York Rieslings. Um, So that was, you know, esoteric enough in 1978 to satisfy my wino friends from across (laughs) the street. Anyway, those were the old days. So how many years ago was that? Uh, three. 70, let's say it was 1977. So close to 50, right? Yeah, 40 yeah, something. Yeah. 45 anyway. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. All right. So I, I have my work cut out for me. Uh, <laughs> well, let's, let's, I, I'm gonna, my carb of the day is going to be spoon bread, but this time I'm making my own recipe. All right. Let, let us know how it works out next week. I will. All I right. will. Carbs are calming. <laughs> Okay. All right, Arthur, take care. Arthur Schwartz, the food maven, here on Robin Hood Radio, uh, robinhoodradio.com on the web. Underwriting support for Arthur Schwartz, the food maven, Hillsdale Home Chef. More information, 518-325-7000, hgshomechef.com.